The second paper um, in this session today is from a um, group from Victoria University of Wellington and University of Lisbon and University of South Australia. Uh, the title is Adventures in Hologram Space, Exploring the Design Space of Eye-to-Eye -eye Volumetric Teleprisms. And today we have Dr. Rafael Kofner dos Anjos um, as a presenter. He is a postdoc researcher at Computational Media Innovation Center at Victoria University of Wellington. And he received his PhD in Information Systems and Computer Science at Technico Lisboa. His current research interests are real-time rendering, 3D capture, and reconstruction, image-based rendering, virtual and augmented reality. So, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rafael. Uh, this is the title of my paper, Adventures in Hologram Space. Uh, we're focusing on exploring the design space of an eye to eye volumetric present experience. Um, so, first of all, um, why am I talking about holograms? Uh, why is this even a relevant problem nowadays? Um, so first, just to make it clear, when I talk about holograms, I'm not talking about the special print that you have on your credit cards. I'm talking about the sci-fi representation of holograms. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll use that word, I'm talking about this. This is Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall in the 90s. So holograms, as we know it from sci-fi, have been very popular uh, in pop culture, uh, being uh, as a 3D recording that you can see ephemeral in the out of thin air. Um, also recently, Blade Runner, you can see as a gigantic AI uh, figure or a reconstruction of an Elvis Presley show uh, in Kingsman has been used in sci-fi as a communication uh, media through a very modern that we wish we had AR headset. Um, but also Star Wars, right? Um, Star Wars used a lot of holograms. And in this case, we have a recording of Princess Leia. Um, also, they're talking to Obi-Wan here, another miniaturized hologram, uh, a portable hologram where Commander Cody can talk to Palpatine. Uh, also here as a remote conferencing technology where we have someone that is not there. Master Sipotias is sitting on his chair in the Jedi Council. And also AR portable uh, AR technology with Cortana in, in the Halo series. In fact, it's such a popular thing that has its own page on TV tropes. It's, and the first sentence summarizes it very well. A staple of spec speculative fiction, holograms can be created by technological, magical, or physics means. Um, anyway, not only talking about sci science fiction, um, holograms are already starting to happen in uh, our days through several research papers. Here we can see a floating head in this uh, cigarette paper from 2009, where through specialized uh, display, you can see a hologram inside. Um, people using 3D glasses in front of a, uh, a big wall. You can also have the sensation you're talking to a hologram in front of that wall. Um, through AR headset with his Microsoft research paper, holoportation, father can see his own daughter. Uh, if you see in the corners what he sees, this ephemeral hologram. Sadly, she doesn't have a headset, so she can't see her father back, but if she had one, they could communicate. Um, through video projection in a specialized position, people can also have a sensation that they're talking to a hologram, even though it's a 2D image, because it's perspective corrected. Um, and very recently, there's a Nature paper about actually producing a hologram out of thin air on tip of your fingers, but they're still very small. Um, all, and there's a lot of work on projecting on mid-air displays with vapors and everything else. But the uh, bottom line is uh, they're now not only science fiction. Holograms are already in uh, a reality uh, in our days. Maybe not as portable and effective as science fiction, but we have to look at them, right? So what is the problem? Uh, what am I trying to address today? So this is a, a one example scenario that is popular where someone has a miniaturized hologram in his hands and wants to talk to him. What happens is a um, soldier here is looking down when he's talking to his hologram and on the other side he's looking forward. So what happens is uh, the soldier on the right is talking to someone that is looking down, uh, is looking to his chest and on the other hand the, uh, the hooded figure probably is talking to someone who's looking down. So we don't have eye contact here. Icontext is completely lost due to the miniaturization of that hologram. 
And this is something that happens in a lot of uh, movies, and it's typically corrected by movie magic, where when the scene cuts, the character is looking to the other side. Um, well, so if we're using full scale, it's not a problem. It works, and it has been seen in this work, room to room, when it's done 16. If we're using a floating head, we can just place the floating head right in front of your face, and it will also work. Um, but if we need to miniaturize, which is a very useful uh, use case, this uh, 2018 paper where uh, AR headset user can see a miniaturized ver version of a remote person to provide remote assistance, or let's say you want to have teleconferencing with someone on the top of your desk and you don't want it to be a huge person, you want it to be the adequate size, eye contact is lost. So how can we ensure eye contact in this situation? So I'll quickly go to uh, some of the functions of eye contact, which I think it's an important discussion to bring to the AR community, and especially in this session we're talking about collaboration. Uh, we need to talk about why is eye contact even important in communication, especially in remote communication. So I'll, there's a lot of uh, things in psychology uh, talking about why eye contact is important. I picked four topics that I believe are very important to also remote communications, and I'll go through each one of them with some level of detail. Uh, first one is turn-taking. Uh, this is an example scenario where we have three people talking, and by their eye contact, you can clearly uh, see who's speaking. There's a guy uh, in his back, because both of the others are looking at him. Um, so through eye contact, we can clearly know who's speaking right now. Um, also, indicate a presence of a third person. If this guy suddenly looks away, everyone knows there's, a, there's in this case, a fourth person fourth person walks in the conversation. So, especially in a remote scenario, uh, you, don't, you don't have awareness of your partner's environment. You need to know, you need to have proper eye contact to know if they're talking to you or if they're talking to someone else that just walked in the room. Moreover, um, turn-taking, there are more subtle cues that can inform us about turn-taking. People tend to look up and away right before speaking and right before finishing uh, their sentence. So. If you think about it, when you want to say something, you might look away a little bit and then look at the person and say, because it's a very subtle cue. And in this case, uh, we can again see that the guy with uh, finger in hand is talking. Um, both, both of the others are looking at him. When he finishes speaking, he might make eye contact again. Or, and the guy on the left is probably signaling he will start speaking. So these subtle cues as well will facilitate uh, people understand when it's my turn to speak, is the other guy done or not? Um, yeah, this is the guy who is in control now. Uh, second thing is information seeking. This is a scene from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, a, a TV show I highly recommend it. Um, Detective Jay Peralta is interrogating a suspect and through eye contact you can see how the information you transmitted has been received. So you say something, and through the amount of eye contact the person establishes with you, you can see how the message you just transmitted is received. In this case, he's laying out a very elaborate theory of how the guy committed the murder, and this probably indicates something. He's look, looking past Detective Jake Broad. I won't spoil the rest of the episode because it's a really good one, but um, if we're doing, if we want to have uh, use holograms and remote communication for more serious things than just talking to someone in a gimmicky way, if we want to use it for interrogation, interviews, dating, or something else, we need to know how our information is getting to the other side. Um, third topic is cooperation, likeness, and social status. Um, through the amount of eye contact that people establish when they're talking, you can see if they're cooperating or competing. You can see how much they like each other, and also some differences in social status. Uh, the superior guy has a certain amount of eye contact than the underlying, the maybe an uh, employee and a base level talking to a CEO. In this case, an example of a job interview where clearly we can see that this guy is enjoying the candidate. He's saying like, oh, you're seeing something very interesting. He's looking attentively to what she's seeing, so uh, indicates likeness. So again, this needs to be in remote communications to make it useful. Um, finally, the nature of the topic, this is a more subtle one. But uh, it's known that people establish more eye contact when they're talking about straightforward issues. So talking about work, people will look uh, 
each other in the eyes more when they're discussing work than if they're talking about personal issues. Someone talking about something personal, they might look uh, in uh, instead of looking to the other person, right? So from this conversation, we can see they're talking about some spreadsheets or something because uh, they're establishing some high amount of eye contact. So also remote communication, we need to know, understand is, is he talking about work or is he talking about some personal issues that I should uh, pay attention to right now. Um, so bottom line is promoting eye contact in hologram-based applications. We will allow people to use these cues that they are used to in, the, in their day-to-day -day communications. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about how can we ensure uh, eye contact in, let's say, any hologram-based application. So we, we, we define something called the hologram space and with some variables that will go into some different use case scenarios. And finally, a simple approach to make sure whatever application you do, if you follow these guidelines, you have eye contact. So let's give this two, situa uh, two, uh, two locations, location A and B, with speakers A and B. Uh, the blue version here is the hologram, just so we keep in the sci-fi visualization so you guys clearly understand who's a hologram. Important variables are just the height of the user, a P where is the position where the user currently is, and F being the track floor of where they are. So first problem is, let's say speakers A and B have this exact same height and they're in two remote locations, but uh, one guy is talking to a hologram that is right in front of him on the floor, and the other guy is talking to a hologram that is on top of the table. So they're talking to a hologram position in different surfaces. What would happen is what we've seen before, it will break eye contact. And this is what we want, which is a proper scaling to make sure eye contact happens. So in this case, the solution is pretty simple. We just need to downscale a hologram and the other space uh, just enough to make eye contact using their height differences, right? So we just scale the other hologram up until my height, scale down. And on the other side, because we have the same height, we can, I can just not do anything and we'll be looking each other into the eye. Okay, so solution will have A and C in this case. Problem number two, what if we have a height difference between people? I will exaggerate here with the example of someone talking to their son, a little baby, but it's not very uncommon to talk to someone who's 30 centimeters shorter than you, uh, which could also bring some sort of problems. So if I want to talk to uh, my nephew, who's a baby, what would happen? On the other side, we have to highly scale this baby in order to make eye contact. We, uh, on the paper, we call this the big baby problem. So what's the problem having a big baby? Um, a big baby, uh, their eyes would be widely separated from each other. Uh, I would, how would I establish eye contact? We have to go from one eye to the other. I don't know where to look first. Also, it's not natural. It's a gigantic baby in, my, in the middle of my living room. And so there are a lot of interaction things that wouldn't work properly if I'm talking to a giant hologram. Uh, not talking now about a father, uh, uh, uncle, nephew scenario, father, son scenario. If we talk about a, a business meeting and we have a gigantic representation of our employee, uh, we might feel like, Oh, is he, does he think he's bigger than me? Does he think he's, there's a social status, like people attribute immediately to the size of the re representation that probably comes from uh, pop culture. If you think about Star Wars or other movies, the gigantic emperor that shows up and people bow down to it. So um, this, might be, uh, ha this might have some added weight of um, social status, which uh, we wanna avoid. So what do we do here? we just downscale enough uh, the representation so we can keep the height difference consistent in both spaces. So if the baby was here, I would just have the baby on this side and downscale my representation on the other side to keep the height differences. So that would work. But that's not all. There's more variables that we have to consider, uh, which is the third and final problem is the relative position to the surfaces. So. It's so, the same scenario now where we had someone here and other person talking to someone on top of it, uh, a box or a table. Uh, if you walk away, uh, just using the height differences won't make it. So our correction needs to go through uh, using the angle of angle that someone looks to the, uh, the other guy in the other position and make sure on both sides we keep the same angle. 
So this would happen. We copy the, we use the certain, the angle that we should use, calculate how much we should downscale to keep the same viewing angle. I'll go into a little bit more detail, but basically the solution here is using an angle-based correction of height, only talking about the scale. Um, there are two obvious factors that we can, we have to consider, which are if, I walk, if I'm walking around a tracked area, I should always be at the center of the hologram projection, so it's just a translation to the center. And also, uh, the, face, uh, the users should always be facing the correctly. So, and that's a simple problem to, to fix, where you just rotate it back to the, uh, you see the rotation, the relative rotation someone has to the position where the hologram is, uh, is positioned, and you just translate that to the other side. So if you look at the hologram on one place, on the other side, you will be looking at the person. So this is the flow chart of the uh, solution. Um, it's a very simple solution, but I'll go into three cases that I believe is easier to understand. Uh, simplest case is, first case, um, if uh, we're able to downscale the remote user representation locally, and we know that the new scale will enable the other guy to downscale our representation to provide eye contact, we end the algorithm. So this is the case where the hologram is just taller than me, I can just downscale. A second case, which is this baby case, uh, our, we have to check if we are able to downscale the remote user representation locally, but if we know that he, if we downscale their representation, we have to upscale our representation, we just scale using the angle base difference. So we don't force them to correct it. Final case, if we're on the other side, if we're not on the baby side, if we're forced to upscale locally to provide eye contact, we don't do anything, we leave it as it is, and we hope that on the other side, he'll perform this operation. And we tested it. I'll show, this is a mock-up scenario, because this is the sci-fi scenario where we're talking to a hologram. You can recognize Daniel that's sitting right there. Uh, one of the authors of the paper is part of the video as an actor. Um, he, uh, here's uh, what you would see from, a, uh, from the AR headset when you're talking to a hologram. Um, but this is just a sci-fi view of it. Um, this is the actual prototype that we built to test this algorithm, where we use OptiTrack cameras, Method 2, HMD, just for the uh, bigger field of view, so we can see the whole body. Um, OptiTrack rigid body is to track the head position, and an OptiTrack rigid body to track the person, connect sensors to transmit the point clouds through a uh, network. Um, it's, the holograms were in blue, this is just so you understand that's a hologram. Um, we did a small evaluation where users had a quick riddle to solve, and then we would evaluate how well they communicated while solving the riddle. So first, uh, on comfort and the experience, how well they communicated, uh, we had uh, considerably high scores. Um, they could understand turn-taking and everything else naturally, so even using the uh, teleconferencing uh, solution. It was easy. We believe it's people are already getting used to Skype, so it also helps in doing uh, turn-taking. However, uh, regarding eye contact, we had very varying results. We had people that said we had a lot of eye contact. People say we had a lot, not a lot of eye contact. Why is that? So if we look at this guy that's wearing the exact headset that we use for the test, where is he looking? I would say he's looking this way but it's fair enough if you say he's looking any other way, because you can't see his eyes. Uh, it's a little bit reflective, uh, the mirror. So this was, if you assume yellow, yes, you would answer, yes, we had a lot of eye contact. If you assume red, maybe not. We had pairs of people that after the study, one reported a uh, maximum in a zero to six Likert scale eye contact, and the partner uh, answered one, no eye contact at all, and they were saying, oh, I was looking at your headset, and the other one, no, uh, I didn't know if you were looking to the side where you had the headset. This is something that was already concluded by a 2016 paper from Ward Scolano, um, which will lead us to some future works remarks that I will get in the next slide. But general remarks, we can say that scaling was an inadequate size to interact with the remote partner and use full body gestures. Uh, people uh, showed an appropriate behavior. They had less eye contact when they're focusing on the problem and more contact when we're discussing topics. They had increased eye contact when they were laughing or agreeing about a topic, which validates the cooperation and likeness 
uh, a queue that we talked about, and overall no problem with communication. Uh, future work in this area, um, moving headsets from vendor avatars, it, it has been done, uh, CBREF paper last year. It is challenging still, it's, it needs specialized hardware, it's not accessible to everyone. Um, using alternative types of, of visualizations might be a good answer. Uh, so no holograms with AR headsets, but with screens or real holograms. But if that's the case, uh, these techniques should be as flexible as AR headsets in order to be valid. Um, that's it for from me. Uh, special thanks to co-authors from Portugal that couldn't make it. Uh, Daniel is here. Uh, other authors are close by, Australia New Zealand. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the audience? We start provoking. Thank you for the very nice presentation and citing all of the new movies. I have a question: Is that because I see in the picture we will show this user study scenario? Yeah. Is that a scaling up scaling dy dynamic? Is that because I yeah, think it's it, dynamic? So it's tracking the users and they will shrink whether yeah. you are on the table or on the floor. Yeah. So um, we use the optic track rigid body to check what's the position, and through the optic track rigid body on the head, we know the height of the user. So they could pick up the the marker, and it would scale and keep eye contact. Uh, for the test, we would leave it there. Um, we the, the way the user study worked, they had a first time to just solve the riddle and talk about it, and during that time, the, the rigid body was there. Uh, we advised them not to touch it, so we could have a a baseline where everyone's looking at the same place, same relative distance. And after that, we would have a more informal conversation where they were free to pick it up and talk to each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this image, is this, you said that it's not blue, but this is, you use stereoscopic video for your avatars? Or you uh, point cloud. Point cloud. Point clouds, okay, yeah. so this is just a like, mock-up thing. Yeah, because uh, the problem is, um, Meta 2 HMD, um, had uh, it was really hard to capture what it was actually rendering. Uh, what is actually rendering does wouldn't match exactly what was in the mirroring that we got on the computer. So if we recorded what was in the computer, you wouldn't see any eye contact. So um, in this case, we use um, it's a mock-up of the situation. But what you would see would be more similar to this, uh, but people having headsets. Cool. We just removed the That's headsets here. And so you have some kind of negotiation between the two when you initiate the communication. Who's going to see what, or uh, like uh, exchange? So it sends the information on how big the was the position of the avatar. Yeah. So um, we had uh, we know that we you can only see one connect here. We had two connects like this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the question. We would transmit the use two connects to cover the point cloud and avoid some occlusions from uh, hand gestures. Uh, that's transmitted over the network, and we use a toolkit uh, called the Creepy Tracker Toolkit um, that we developed in our, our lab a couple of years ago, which can it helps calibrate everything and match positions with headset and different tracking systems. We will take one more question. Any questions from the audience? Um, do you have any feedback about? Um, if people felt really small when they were like <laughs> shrunk, um, yeah. So from the user study, people felt that uh, the partner was in an adequate size. Um, we had a pilot study where we were not doing any scaling, uh, so people were pretty small. And we noticed when people were really small, they would treat the remote uh, uh, the remote guy as more of a gimmick, more of a toy. They wouldn't interact much with it. When it was bigger, uh, so they would have eye contact, they would interact a lot more with it. But uh, one of the future things we want to study is um, the big baby scenario, if size will have that sort of impact. But we need to do a, just a standalone study on that. If people have concerns of how do I look on the other side, or how or feeling that the other guy is misrepresented. But with the with this scaling that we use, that you can see um, in that, that one slide, people thought it was adequate. So no concerns on both sides. Sure. Sorry, 
What about multiple <coughs> avatars? You, you, yeah. you showed the two two people scenario, yeah. so because there's the body rotation coming yeah. into place as well. So you thought about it? Yeah. So um, that's future. One of one of the things we talked about future work is if we're talking on a multiple scenario, it would work. Uh, the just the orientation. If we just fix the, do that operation where we fix uh, the uh, the horizontal plane rotation, but the scaling is something we need to look at because um, if they're widely different scales, we need to know how to represent the other guy, and that's one of the future work directions. Thank you. That's thanks to Shikar again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.